All right, so uh, let me first begin with the acknowledgements to the, the Big Data to Knowledge BD2K program of NIH, National Institute of Health in general, and the National Science Foundation for their support. Uh, you heard quite a bit uh, of wisdom from the way uh, on the biosensors, and then uh, from Erdogan, uh, the assessment of biosensors for using optics, or lens free microscopy. Uh, so those are all systems to assess the biofluids. What I'm going to talk about will be uh, I mean, assessment using the more mundane uh, regular uh, wearable sensors. And my focus will be uh, more on the validation side. And so I'd like to present to you some uh, two different case studies to showcase uh, how to approach validation of, of biomarkers obtained from this uh, wearable sensors. So first, I mean, wearable sensors, uh, they come in wide varieties. Uh, smartphone is the first one that has GPS, accelerometry, then smartwatches, uh, chest bands uh, with ECG respiration, and then smart eyeglasses that can measure both uh, your uh, visual exposure as well as they can assess your eyes. They can have other sensors embedded in them that can assess your pulse and your head movement and so on. Uh, using this, uh, these sensors, you can uh, get exposure, uh, exposure measurements, uh, mostly from, say, GPS or uh, from other sensors that are on the smartwatches. Uh, exposures to pollution, exposures to traffic, exposures to various um, uh, environmental uh, triggers. Then you can have measurement of various behaviors, daily behaviors using the sensors, whether they are of sedentary behavior, eating, smoking, uh, conversation, addic other addictive behaviors. And then you can also have measurement of outcomes. So uh, like uh, when I say outcomes, meaning that's health states. So mobile uh, sensors, they can help measure exposures that can influence health outcomes. Behaviors, which uh, can also have affect health outcomes. And then the change or the effect of these exposures and behaviors as well. So they provide you with a very powerful platform to be able to uh, assess what happens to an individual and what is the impact or influence of those on the health state of the individual. So I usually think of the uh, work of mobile, of the capability of mobile sensors in these three uh, paradigms: detect, uh, predict and adapt. So let me explain each one. So by detect, we mean being able to have early detection of any adverse health state before uh, I mean, irreparable damage happens. So in this case, I mean, so uh, we work with two examples in MD2K. In one case, it's a smoking cessation where we can detect first lapses. And if we can detect first lapses, hopefully intervention can be provided uh, that can get the individual back to becoming abstinent. Uh, in say congestive heart failure, that's the second application in there I mean, by measuring uh, level of fluid fluid uh, accumulation in the lungs. You can have some measure of congestion, and if you can detect that early enough, then you can hopefully prevent uh, hospitalization. So that's the example of early detection you can do with mobile sensors. Second, but because you can measure both, uh, I mean the influencing factors, the risk factors, and the influence on the health state. So in this case, I mean, say, occurrence of first uh, lapse in a smoking cessation or the I mean, uh, fluid uh, accumulation in, in the lungs for congestive heart failure, just taking, you know, picking two examples, you can see uh, the various activities or exposures that happen to the individual. What impact did they have on these health state changes? And so you can go back to the, uh, to the data before these adverse events occurred to see what can predict these changes. And if you can predict these adverse events, then you can design interventions to be able to hopefully prevent and truly realize the vision of preventive medicine. The third part is adapt. So because these sensors, they also help you get the current state of the individual. They can also help you get the impact or from um, off the intervention on the person whether the intervention worked on this individual whether they even liked the intervention way they 
they i mean did they just ignore the intervention are they currently in a, i mean so if so you can adapt your intervention to make it more personalized also if the individual is currently driving or in a conversation or in a meeting you could detect that using sensors and then uh, it, that may not be the right moment to intervene uh, to deliver the prompt so you can adapt your intervention based on the individuals response and preferences as well as their current state or the current environments so they can so therefore the sensors can help you uh, with personalized sensor triggered ad context adaptive uh, interventions and that is timely so so i'll first talk about the sensors to markers part uh, so if you want to derive these biomarkers out of these variable sensors what are the things some guiding principles so the first, and the way talked about some of these, but I'll, uh, I mean, in, the, in that point of care system, I'll talk about it in terms of wearable sensors. So first thing, uh, first and foremost is conveniently desired, wearable and desirable. So something that people would like to wear, they're willing to wear, will be enthusiastic to wear day in, day out for, the, for their entire life, for long periods. So if you don't have that, then uh, it will be very hard for you to get the measurement that you desire. Second, it should be safe, uh, shouldn't cause rashes. I mean, uh, so that's uh, almost obvious. Next is robust. Uh, if you are thinking about a sensor that a person is going to wear day in, day out, then there are so many different factors that influence the sensor. Lighting conditions, sound, uh, temperature, humidity, sweating, I mean, right? Uh, so uh, your sensor should be such that it should be able to either collect reliable measurements in all these variety of situations, or at least be able to distinguish when the measurements are of the right quality, usable quality, and when not. And finally, versatile. And uh, I think this word needs some explanation. What do I mean by versatile? So sometimes we get pretty carried away as a researcher. We say, oh, we would like to have this measurement, this measurement, this measurement. What if we could also have the individual provide 10 times uh, from a per day diary uh, information. What if we could also ask them what, what went on? I mean, what, what, uh, I mean, what didn't work? What worked? So we'd like to get all kinds of information from the person. Let's get the blood pressure. Let's get the uh, fluid test. Let's get, right? Uh, let's get cholesterol measurements. Uh, let's get weight measurements. So we'd like to get all kinds of measurements. Mm -hmm. So if if it was up to us, we would I mean why the person top to bottom the sensors. <laughs> <laughs> so and that's not feasible. So again, the first principle conveniently be it. So that um, gives us an opportunity to think about there are really very few sensors that a, that a person would be willing to wear day in, day out. What can we do to get the desirable measurements? out of the data we can collect from the sensor that the person is willing to wear. And that's where you can unleash some of your creativity to think of various models, various indirect measurements, and so on, that will still be clinically useful, but will be very it will be convenient to get. So if, I mean, as an example, if people are willing to wear smart watches, then uh, think about what all information can you get from a smart watches passively rather than having to ask the person or as a having them to wear one on the ankle and one on the head and one on the cap and so on, okay? <clears throat> so the second uh, is, is the clinical part of it. Uh, the biomarker we get should be sensitive and specific. So it should have high recall rate. And why, what I mean by high recall rate in this example, suppose we want to detect, detect eating behavior using a wrist warm sensor. So then first thing, uh, if the sensor is worn on the non-dominant hand and eating happened with the dominant hand, we are going to miss the entire eating episode. Mm. Okay. If suppose you trained your model when, uh, and if, I mean, on yourself and you are a habitual user of uh, say, I mean, fork or the spoon, then that's what your model will be trained to detect. If somebody eats by hand a sandwich, if somebody eats a fruit with both hands, if somebody eats um, using a, 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 <clears throat> using uh, chopsticks, then I mean, each of these involve different kinds of gestures, and then I mean your model will not work. Right? So, so having high recall rate despite all this wide variability is, is important, and because that's what happens in the natural environment. And second, uh, it should have low false positive rate despite numerous confounders, and that is also important because you're talking about the sensors that a person is going to wear 
day in, day out. So that means there are so many different things that they do, uh, which could potentially be a uh, mistake in for the measurement that you're interested in. So in this case, if you are trying to detect eating, this, there are about 2,000 hand-to-mouth gestures that happen during the day. Out of those, some may be because of talking, some may be because of I mean, yawning, some may be because of smoking, and you should be able to rule all of them out so that you can reliably get the eating measurements. And then the validation part of it. So you did all this hard work, you developed a very sensitive and a specific uh, biomarker out of a very conveniently variable biosensor. Now, how do you convince someone that your, your biomarker is that? If there was an existing gold standard that worked in the natural field environment, there was no need for you to create this new biomarker. So, so quite likely, uh, if a gold standard even if existed, it works only in the lab environment. But by uh, testing your, uh, your system in the lab environment, you cannot extrapolate and say it will work in the field environment. So in, the ab in most cases, there is absence of gold standard in the scenario of actual uses that you designed for. So how do you validate, how do you convince yourself, let alone the community, that your biomarker works? So, so I'll quickly talk about the case of a smoking, uh, a smoking detection. Uh, but this, uh, there is a, a much longer video of this, and there is a paper on this that you can see, you can find on M Health Hub. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll quickly talk about it. Uh, this is a case where the the biomarker that we are trying to develop is detection of smoking is for an objective behavior. That means somebody can say whether this happened or not happened. All right, objective. So. <clears throat> So in this case, what we use is a gesture, hand to mouth, uh, mouth gesture of using the wrist sensor and the breathing measurements or deep inhalation and exhalation that happens and the, at the chest cavity. So using a respiration sensor and using a hand, uh, using a wrist sensor is what we use to detect the smoking gestures. Uh, so, I mean, this is, uh, there are lots of challenges in doing so. As I said, there are 10,000 breath cycles in, in 10 hours of hearing. And so if we are trying to identify each smoking puff, so we're trying to identify each cycle, whether this is a, represents a smoking puff or not, and if we have a 10% false positive, so 90% accurate sensor, that means there will be 1,000 respiration cycles in a day that may be falsely declared as smoking. So can you use such a system to detect the first, first lapse in a smoking cessation? Right? Not really. So. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, if, if we are talking about hand-to-mouth gestures, then again, there are 2,000 hand-to-mouth gestures, and even if it's a 90% accurate sensor, it may still not work well. So the, I mean, if, again, what I'm trying to say is that if you are trying to detect something using a sensor that is worn throughout the day, there are so many things that a person does, and your false positive should be analyzed with respect to what happens to the person in the natural environment. And then uh, I mean, uh, there are, uh, sometimes the data is lost, sometimes people don't hear the sensors, and then there are numerous confounders. And then the smoking itself happens in so many different ways. Some, I mean, people hold the cigarette differently. And then I mean, uh, sometimes people uh, smoke while walking, sometimes while talking, sometimes while seated, sometimes while driving. <laughs> Right, so there are so many different ways that the same uh, I mean, hand-to-mouth gesture works. So building a detector that works in all these circumstances is, is non-trivial, but that's why it's a research task. Right? Uh, <clears throat> so I would, uh, as I said, I wouldn't talk about how we, how we did it. Uh, I'd only talk about how we went about its validation part. So we collected first the lab data where there was an observer who, who marked we, we had the person, we allowed the participant to smoke in their natural setting and an observer seated at a distance marked on the phone each puff, the timing of each puff, on the same phone on which the sensor data was collected to have the right accurate timing. And so that was the lab study data. And that's what was used to develop and train the model. To test the model, we applied it on the data collected in a smoking cessation study where uh, there were these smokers who uh, wore the sensors for three days post quit after quitting, one day pre quit and three days post quitting. And so the model was just applied on them. And each day they returned to the lab and they provided a I mean, CO uh, expired breath sample for CO monitoring. 
to see whether I mean they had a smoke the previous day or not. Okay, so uh, there were some which were verified to be abstainers, so that means they did not smoke. So that means if our system detected any smoking event on those people for those three days, that means those were false alarms. So that's what we use to assess the false alarm of the system. Now for true positive, uh, so we had lapsers, so those who lapsed, and uh, that was again verified by the CO detection, but uh, we only know that they lapsed the previous day, but right? uh, if they showed up and tested positive in the next, uh, in, in the next uh, lab visit. Uh, so we applied our model to detect uh, whether we can we or we detect a smoking event on them or not, and that's what we use for our true uh, true positive test. Okay, so so for um, and we ask them to provide self report as well, but that's not as good of a of a gold standard. All right. So uh, so what we I mean established was that uh, in uh, 28 out of the 32 cases we were able to detect the first lapse. So what happened to the remaining four? Uh, there were two cases where, the, where people didn't wear the sensor. They got up in the morning and uh, then they lapsed. And so before wearing the sensor, in other cases, the data was lost or was of poor quality. So that means when people were wearing the sensors, then uh, it was, it was uh, detected by the system. And then, in terms, uh, and then we had uh, one false episode detected every six days of wearing. So, so that's that's uh, one test, and the system will undergo further testing. So the lessons here are: uh, there was no gold standard for the true, uh, true positive or for the recall, right? So I mean, we know that the participant lapsed the previous day, and our system did detect a smoking event. Was this a first lapse that our system detected? Did our system miss the first lapse but detected the second lapse? If that second lapse also happened on the, on the same day, we just don't know because there is no such gold standard that we can collect in the field that will tell us the precise timing of the lapse, which is what the system is trying to detect. Also, I mean, our system uh, uses, I mean, four puffs uh, as the minimum number of puffs in a smoking episode to, to declare it as a smoking event. So if they were taking le less than four puffs, then it's possible that our system might miss it. Uh, also, I mean, e-cigarettes, e they'd have a very different holding pattern. So it's quite likely if that there was any e-cigarette smoking event, then our system may not have caught it. So there are I mean, uh, lots of areas where the system still doesn't work well. All right. So this is where the paper was published. And if you were, if you'd like to take a look, I mean, you're welcome to. The second uh, part that I will talk about is uh, <clears throat> is from from uh, markers to intervention. So suppose we have a time series of these markers. Uh, how do we get to intervention? So that's one. Uh, also in this uh, in this part, what I would like to talk about is a marker that doesn't have an objective gold standard. So in the smoking, an observer can see a smoker and say, "Yes, taking the puff right now," and you can mark it. But if we are talking about a stress, no observer can say this person, this individual is stressed or not stressed, right? So how do we get the gold standard in such cases? And so the validation for such uh, biomarkers becomes a little different. So, and then, uh, so I'll talk about that. I mean, so I'll first talk about I mean, uh, the validation of this uh, stress marker. And then second thing I would point out is that if suppose we have the sensor-based stress marker that gives a stress uh, I mean, uh, likelihood for each minute of measurement that we have the sensor data for. So you have I mean, say, uh, uh, 60 minutes in an hour, I mean, in 10 hours of wearing, you have 600 minutes. Uh, so we have 600 samples, 600 data points. If we want to trigger an intervention to help reduce, manage somebody's stress, so we want to detect stress, and when the stress level is high, we want to trigger an intervention. There are 600 samples in the day. How many times should we intervene? What do you think? How many times are you willing to withstand an intervention that's trying to help you manage your stress level? <laughs> 100 times? 10 times? No, it depends on what you're going to call it. 
600 samples. samples. So how, how many of those samples have continuously read positive? That all depends on what threshold we build. Yes. So, so, but it all depends on what, how many times the person is willing to be interrupted. That task itself might cause stress, oh. let alone reduce the stress. Right. It may also that. depend on, on what constitutes a viable stress. Measure stress. I mean, if I have one spike, does that, does that count? I mean, is that good enough? Who knows? <laughs> right. So, so, so there are both issues of rapid variability. Yeah. Then there is the issue of receptivity, right? So, at most, I mean, few times, couple times a day is I mean, what you would be willing to withstand. So, out of those 600 samples, we are supposed to pick those two, three opportune moments. So, how do you go about taking this time series of biomarkers that's flowing like a stream and in real time make a decision? as to when are those two, three most opportune moments in the day. So that is the task of going from markers to interventions. Okay. So let me see if I can address both, but quickly. <laughs> All right, so that you can get on with your uh, project discussions. Uh, <clears throat> so, if, um, so first I'll talk about the, the stress measurement. So the model of the stress measurement, and again, this is subject of a paper and there are, there are talks about it that you can find online. Uh, so this takes the ECG and respiration measurements and, uh, and then uh, derives various features out of it then builds a machine learning model. And that's, uh, that's what outputs the likelihood of being stressed. So uh, I mean, there's uh, lots of, uh, I mean, when you have all these physiological sensors in the field, there are lots of sources of noises and artifacts and I mean, outliers and so on. So uh, there is an elaborate process of cleaning the data, doing the data quality checks, and then deriving the uh, I mean, features and then normalizing the features to each person because each person's physiology responds differently, right? And you can't train it on, on each individual before you ask them to use it. So there is some self-calibration built in. So all of that happens. Um, uh, with these sensors, and, and then uh, then we are, we are nearing to uh, get a model. But before we apply that model, we also look at whether there was physical activity present, and if the physiology activation is due to physical activity, then that should not be mistaken for stress. That's dealing with confounders. So it's not only, I mean, so you can use axiometry to detect when the person is physically active, but physiology, I mean, does not I mean, return back to normal immediately as soon as the physical activity stops. There is time for recovery. So um, usually what people do is say, okay, I mean, the, you wait for two minutes after the physical activity ends, and then you can begin. So it, it may take up to two minutes for the body to recover. But if we do so, then the physical activity itself happens about 23% of the day. Uh, this is in a college population. And then if we throw away two, two minutes following each physical activity, then we'll, we'll throw away 35% additional data. So we'll be left with 50% with data for a stress assessment. So, but what we can do is we can estimate the rate of recovery of each individual, uh, which is different, and it depends on the level of activity that they were engaged in. And by doing so, you, yeah, you can really save quite a bit. And with that, I mean, only 7% additional data will have to be. So again, what I was trying to say here is that I mean, uh, it's important to pay attention to the confounders. All right, and do your best to uh, to get as much uh, useful data as possible. So, uh, how did we go about the validation? So, first for training, what did we use as gold standard? So, in the lab, I mean, we could have used the self-report as gold standard, but self-report has lots of issues. So, what we used for gold standard was the lab protocol. So, we had people come to the lab; they went through public speaking, mental arithmetic, and cold pressure tests, which is known to I mean, induce the stress in most people. And so the minutes when they were doing those tests is what we took as gold standard that each individual is stressed during these minutes and they are not stressed in the, during the baseline and recovery. So, so that's what we used to develop the model. And then, but in the field, when we go to the field, we can't take all our, our stress test in the field after because we do that. So in the field, what we have is the self-report. So, but then the I mean, physiology, uh, the rate of uh, activation and the recovery of physiology is at a different time scales than that of the perception of the stress. So um, when you have a stressor, your physiology may recover quickly, but its, uh, it's perception may linger in your mind for longer. 
So we can't just take the minutes preceding the self-report to say if the person stayed stressed in the next self-report. It must be the case, something must have occurred in the minutes preceding that. It could be that they, they received their um, information about their paper, acceptance or rejection, <laughs> or about their big grant that they are hoping for 10 minutes ago. Right, so their body may have recovered, but if you ask them even half an hour later, they are still quite upset <laughs> or excited, whichever be the case. Right, so so therefore, I mean, we have to have the right model for validation. So in this case, we had a dynamic Bayesian network that allowed for different rates of recovery and rate of activation for physiology versus the self-report. <clears throat> and uh, so that's what is used for to validate against self-reports. So. <clears throat> So what you see here are some numbers. I'll just point out a few things. Uh, one is that if you use heart rate variability alone for a stress assessment, then you get an accuracy of about 0.5, um, 0.56 but, uh, of F1 score. But if you use all the measures from intrabeat interval, so take the various other features out of the intrabeat interval and the restoration, then you can get a F1 score of 0.81. So, there is, uh, so if you use heart rate variability alone for a stress measurement, then you may be about 70% there. Of, of how much uh, information you could get about assessed assessment of someone. Uh, second thing I would say is that I mean, <clears throat> the uh, validation with respect to the to the self report, uh, we get uh, I mean, a median F1 uh, score of 0.71 when tested in the field. Okay, so this is on the college population. So all of that can be done. If you just use ECG, I mean, is that worth it? Uh, say again. So 0.78 is really close to 0.81. Yes. So so if you so if you use so that's saying that if you use ECG alone, but use all the features out of intrabeat interval, if you can get good intrabeat interval, say out of the risk center, then this model will work quite well. And then you don't need all that. You don't need that. Yet. If you can get good, accurate intrabeat intro. Was this on the wrist or a chest? This was on the chest. Ah, with the Yeah, with yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, so next uh, we went ahead and uh, looked at the, uh, the performance of this model in a different population. This was 38 illicit drug users who wore the census for four weeks. And we looked at the F, uh, from the median F1 score against the self-report here as well. And so this is, I mean, we get one F1 score for each participant here because we are trying to evaluate whether we can uh, predict each of the self-report provided by the person. And so you see that, uh, so first what we did is we looked at the consistency among the self-report itself. So that means when we ask the people to report their stress we use five items uh, I mean five different items if we look at the consistency across the five items itself that's about uh, 0.84 so meaning here as opposed to the smoking this is a subjective phenomena you can't expect to have 100 percent accuracy and neither should you uh, should you i mean uh, have it if you have it there's something terribly wrong okay so uh, <clears throat> So that's that's what we have here, and you see that those for which it is uh, I mean, the accuracy is very poor, their consistency of their self-report itself is pretty. Uh, then in the smoking cessation data set, uh, we saw that the, the F1 score is lower, and the reason is that the the consistency of self-report itself during this post-quit period that's quite low. I mean, it's 0.76 as opposed to 0.84, which we had in, even in the illicit drug user data. So, so, uh, so ultimately, what we get is from uh, from each of the participants, we get this uh, I mean, the likelihood of being stressed. We apply a threshold, and that gives us a stress versus not a stressed. Okay. So we can plot that, uh, or, or the likelihood of being stressed. We can plot that as a time series throughout the entire day. As I said, we have 600 uh, time points with some missing due to physical activity, some missing due to data lost, and so on. But uh, that could be potentially be filled in. So next, we want to identify those stress episodes, which can be used for triggering of the intervention. And so uh, we, we apply some smoothing and we use some uh, method from the uh, uh, moving average convergence divergence that's used in the stock trading to decide when to buy and sell. So a similar method can be trained for this uh, dealing with this time series as well. 
And so uh, we detect each of the change points. And then uh, when there is an increasing trend, there is a decreasing trend. And what we, uh, that's it, this is becomes one episode, uh, which, and then we can get the density of that episode, which we can start to use as the metric to decide when is the right moment to intervene. So, so because here we have to select, select a very few uh, members out of the 600 samples, we want to be even more, more certain that yes, it is the right moment. So it's not because of the inaccuracy of the machine learning model. It's not due to the rapid variability. And so for that, we uh, not, instead of having the two classes of stress, not a stress, we now have three classes because we want to be confident when we are saying stressed, we want to be more confident that it is indeed stressed. When we say not stressed, again, we want to be confident about that. So that means we are left with some that is unsure. Okay, where we are not really sure because these are these uh, measurements are very close to the boundary. Okay, so and then as I was talking about the threshold. So it depends on about how much confidence do we want to have and what frequency do we expect. So what you can see here is that if suppose we want to have 95% confidence, then uh, I mean, we uh, we will um, we see about one and a half uh, stress episode per day in this population during their post quit period. Uh, if we go for 90% precision and recall, uh, then about 1.7. If we go for 85%, then uh, we have about four stress episodes per day. And uh, the reason that, uh, and we selected this for our stress intervention trial is because I mean, then we, uh, we want to have micro randomization and uh, to decide when to uh, trigger intervention when not. Okay. All right. So, if, uh, so sorry, I'm rushing a little bit uh, because of the time constraint, uh, but I'm hoping that you still see some of the lessons. And uh, from what I reported here uh, is uh, described in two papers. And uh, uh, this is the uh, ACMKI uh, 16, uh, 2016 paper. And then this, uh, and the, the design we are using in our just-in-time uh, the stress intervention with the smoking cessation population that Bonnie is playing at Northwestern is, is uh, going to do as part of MD2K that is described in this book chapter, which, which is part of a book that we, Susan Murphy, Jim Ray, and I are editing uh, as an intro book for those who are starting out in health. It should hopefully be out in 2016. <clears throat> so, uh, so I talked about the stress marker and the smoking uh, detection. The other markers that uh, we are working on in MD2K is craving, uh, eating, uh, brushing. That's uh, as part of Vivek's project uh, uh, and, uh, from NIDCR. And then uh, cocaine use detection from the heart rate uh, data. Uh, that's part of NIDA Clinical Trials Network. Detection of conversation. Again, I was talking about the uh, assessment of eyes, focal dilation, uh, or saccades from the eyeglasses. Uh, exposure to uh, TV advertisements, uh, then uh, lung fluid congestion for congestive heart failure, then exposure to fast food, exposure to tobacco outlets. So this, uh, this is a, a sample of the various biomarkers that is being developed in MD2K. If any of this interests you, most of these uh, will be available. Some of them are already available, they're stress and smoking. Uh, they will be available as uh, open source software. Uh, the first person is out there on the MD2K website that has implementation of the stress and smoking. Uh, also, it has the, the, uh, all the software necessary to trigger the intervention or EMA in response to uh, these, these markers of stress or smoking. And uh, this is uh, available both as downloadable that way you can update and I mean, decide your own EMA items that you want and what rule do you want for EMA triggering or for intervention triggering. triggering. And then it has privacy controller in it as well. Uh, and uh, in addition to being down downloadable and configurable, it's also available as open source. So you can take the entire code and run with it. And uh, uh, even if you go start a company and make billions of dollars, you don't have to pay a dime <laughs> to us. <laughs> All right, so it is meant to spur the, uh, spur the, um, the use of mobile um, data, collection of high frequency mobile sensor data and uh, development of sensor triggered interventions. Okay, uh, so I uh, have this last slide that uh, we have been doing as part of this ML Training Institute 
as to if you are a health researcher, why work with a sensing expert? So it makes sense to work with a sensing expert if suppose you're looking for a new biomarker or looking to develop a sensor trigger interfunction. Uh, and and uh, why uh, should researchers work with sensing experts is that I mean, many of, of the times the analysis of the sensor data is still I mean, something that requires some uh, deep computing expertise and therefore having uh, some of them on board might help make your research uh, work out well. But if you are one of those who, who is after that novelty, but then do remember that this novelty comes at a price. If you are an early adopter, then it takes forever for the tech to work and work well. And so you have to be patient with it. Uh, if you have that level of patience, then I think you should, you should go ahead and, and uh, take the plunge. All right, thank you.